Jared Murray decided that he wanted to kill someone. That's it. He hadn't been in a fight with anyone. Nobody had stolen his girlfriend, and he wasn't trying to steal their money. He simply decided that he wanted to take someone's life. So he did. This is Monsters. Jared Murray was born on July 20th, 1994, and grew up in Asher, Oklahoma. This small town covers about three-quarters of a square mile, or about two square kilometers, and had a population of about 400 people in 2010. Jared was considered to be the weird kid, according to his classmates. He would often wear a black suit to school because he said he, quote, liked the weight of it, end quote. Teachers said that Jared was extremely intelligent, but he didn't want to do his schoolwork, so he ended up failing out of his classes. He ended up withdrawing from school and getting his GED. School officials said that Jared didn't have any record of violence at school and hadn't gotten into trouble for anything. Police in the Asher area also said that they had never had a problem with Jared. It was a small town, so they had seen him around, but he had never gotten into trouble. Once he obtained his GED, Jared began attending East Central University in Ada, Oklahoma, about 30 minutes southeast of Asher. He told the undersheriff who interviewed him that he wanted to become a chemist for the Department of Defense. While at college, Jared's strange behavior began showing itself. In October of 2012, while playing video games with some friends in the dorm room across the hall, Jared started boasting about his martial arts skills and claimed that he would rather die than tap out if he was in a fight. The resident of the room, Wyatt Freeman, called his bluff and offered to put Jared in a chokehold to see if he'd really refuse to tap out. Jared allowed Wyatt to put him in the chokehold, which caused Jared to pass out. When he awoke, Wyatt claimed that Jared was faking it and the two got into a fight. Jared punched Wyatt and when he was told to leave, he spit on Wyatt and retreated to his room across the hall. A resident advisor arrived to the area to try to put the situation to rest, but Jared attacked Wyatt again. This is when the police were called. This one police report is the only criminal record that Jared had. He wasn't punished for the assault, though Wyatt did file a complaint with the school asking that Jared be relocated, but the school didn't think that the incident was serious enough to warrant the move. They said that this was not unusual behavior between guys in a college dorm. Though there were no other incidents between the two, Wyatt said he felt uneasy about Jared from that point on. He said in one interview that he thought Jared might try to blow him up. Jared didn't blow anybody up, but he did decide that he wanted to know what it was like to kill someone. Fortunately for Wyatt, Jared's criteria for a target wasn't based on people he had had previous disagreements with. He wanted someone who didn't have a large social circle. Someone who he felt wouldn't be missed as much. He settled on an 18-year-old fellow student who lived in the same dorm building named Gennaro Sanchez. How do you know him? Uh... Towards the beginning of the year, we met in a mutual friend's room uh, playing video games, sir. Okay. And do you take any classes with him? Or? No, sir. Okay. So, you know him through a mutual friend, and you guys know him in the same dorm? Yes, sir. Different different sections? Yes, sir. But it's literally right down the hall. Okay. And so, do you spend quite a bit of time together? Uh, no, sir. No, sir. Coincidentally, Jared had met Gennaro while playing video games in Wyatt's room. Gennaro was present at the time of the fight between Jared and Wyatt, but wasn't involved in the altercation. Jared admitted to not really knowing Gennaro very well. All he knew was that he wasn't a very social person. At least he wasn't while at college. It turned out that Gennaro Sanchez had plenty of friends and family who loved him. He was born on August 7, 1994 in McAllister, Oklahoma, to Marco Sanchez and Gina West. He grew up in Stewart, Oklahoma, and graduated from Stewart High School. He started attending ECU, planning to get a degree in civil engineering. Gennaro was a popular student at high school because he had an outgoing personality. The only reason he had a smaller social circle at college seemed to be because he was new. 
On the night of December 5, 2012, Jared went to Gennaro's dorm room and asked him for a ride. Jared didn't have a car, so the request would not have seemed unusual. Oh, six o'clock in the morning, so can you go back and tell me when you guys got together? Uh, this would have been... Maybe around... <clears throat> maybe around 9 o'clock yesterday evening. Uh, so on the 5th? Yes. Uh, um, maybe it was closer to 10. Okay, 9 to 10. And how did you guys hook up? Uh, I went down to his dorm room and asked if I could be given a ride to Walmart in exchange for $20 gas money. Okay. And did he agree to that? Yes, sir. Okay. And did he, in fact, take you to Walmart? Yes, sir. We got in his pickup truck and he drove me to Walmart. And so you're talking about the Walmart later? Yes, sir. Okay. And that's a couple miles from the school? Uh, 2.2, uh, no, 1.7 miles, sir. 1.7 miles? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, now, so he took you to Walmart? Yes, sir. And did you both go in? No, we did not go in, sir. Okay, and why not? We pulled into the parking lot, then I pulled the uh, weapon on him and demanded that he take me to Asher, Oklahoma, sir. Okay, and why did all of a sudden did you decide that you needed to go to Asher? Because I was planning to take him out into the country and kill him. People ask why Gennaro would have agreed to give Jared a ride after he had seen the altercation between him and Wyatt. Gennaro's mother explained that it was because he always saw the good in people and saw the request as an extended olive branch. He thought this would be a good way to break the ice and become friends. What Gennaro didn't know was that Jared had no interest in going to Walmart. When you got him at the dorm, was your intention... Never go to Walmart? Yes, sir. You was, in fact, was you at that point already in your mind was going to take him and kill him? Yes, sir. Um, had he done something to you? That... No, sir. Okay. So you just, can you kind of tell me when you made this decision that you were going to take him and kill him, why? Uh, I made the decision three days prior to the incident. Uh, attempted it two days prior to the incident, but he was not in his room, and then did so today as he was in his room. Okay. So you've been, you've been planning this for two days? Uh, two weeks, yes. Two weeks. But not with a selected individual, no. Okay. And when did you get to the point where you knew it was going to be him? That was three days prior to the incident. And why him? Uh, all the kids in college here, why, why him? I believed that he would have had the least impact, sir. Impact of on what? Uh, I believed he didn't have many friends, or many close friends, I should rephrase. And as his, <clears throat> as he is going missing, his absence would be less notable. Okay, so what about if tomorrow at school nobody would thought anything of it? Uh, that was the plan, sir, yes. Okay. He thought that less people would notice Gennaro's absence. I want to point out that this was the first step in planning out a murder and trying to not get caught. Jared eventually gets found not guilty by reason of insanity, a subject I've discussed many times before. Being found not guilty of a crime based on mental illness means that you didn't know that what you were doing was wrong. The federal code for an insanity defense says... It is an affirmative defense to a prosecution under any federal statute that, at the time of the commission of the acts constituting the offense, the defendant, as a result of severe mental disease or defect, was unable to appreciate the nature and quality of the wrongfulness of his acts. Mental disease or defect does not otherwise constitute a defense. It seems that the state of Oklahoma used to use a very black-and-white method to determine their insanity defenses. As long as the defendant proved to have any mental illness, they would be found not guilty. It didn't matter if that mental illness affected their understanding of the crime at all. It's very clear in this case that Jared knew exactly what he was doing and that it was wrong, so I'm going to point out all of the things that Jared did to prove that. We're going to start with his plan to choose a victim who wouldn't be noticed. He was giving himself more time to get away before someone called and reported Gennaro missing. This is proof number one. So why did you choose 
to take him to Asher to kill him? When uh, my plan was for after uh, my killing him, I was going to head north towards Canada, and Asher was further north than Ada, so. Okay. Uh, that and uh, I know the surrounding terrain and I knew a good spot. Uh, I didn't have that spot planned in particular. If I had planned that far ahead, I would have had a grave dug. But I knew a general area. Okay. So you brought him to that area because you, you knew that area because he was raised there? Yes, sir. And that's the road that you would travel going back and forth to your mom and dad's house? Uh, no, sir. I would travel the road uh, further to the south of it, just the road one south to it. That's the road I would travel going to my mother's house from the school uh, on my bus route, sir. Yeah, but what I'm saying, you were familiar with that road? Yes, sir. And, yes, sir. And where it would go to? Um, yes, sir. Not much traffic on that road at this time. But yes, sir. I mean, uh, the only people that go on that road are those that live on that road, sir. And you knew that? Yes, sir. Okay. He was going to flee to Canada. Why? Because he knew that what he was doing was wrong. He took Gennaro to his hometown because he knew the area and knew places he could hide the body. Why hide the body? Because he knew what he was going to do was wrong. The pair drove up Highway 177, which went from Ada to Asher, when Jared told Gennaro to turn into a small road that went into an electrical power substation. Past the road to the substation were houses, but they were the only thing up that road, so it was unlikely that many cars would be driving on that road that late at night. And so I guess at some point, did you decide it was, now was the time? Yes, sir. Okay, and what happened? Uh, I loaded the gun quickly, chambered the round quickly, uh, shot once, missed, shot a second time, hit, jumped out of the car, went around, he was driving 10, 15 miles an hour, so it was rather slow. I uh, ran around the hood of the car, and of course it was slow when he wasn't purposefully driving. Uh, tried to pull him out, couldn't get him out until he already had hit the tree. Pulled him out there, dumped him into the... Uh, no, before I dumped him into the ditch, I heard him uh, gurgling. Uh, I'm not sure if that was a physiological or physical process after death, but uh, I thought that he might have still lived through that somehow, because he was gurgling, so I shot him again and then shoved him down in the ditch. I then got his phone. Look at, hang on, let's back up just a second. Yes, sir. Um, you fired the first round. Yes, sir. And you missed. Yes, sir. Do you know where that round hit? Uh, I believe it hit the top of the door, but it might have hit the window. You said, did the window bust? The window did bust, sir, but I don't remember if that was the first or the second round. Okay. So you, you fired once and missed. Yes, sir. And you fired a second round. Yes, sir. And did you hit him then? Yes, sir. And you hit him in the head? In the side of the head, yes, sir. Okay, so it would have been his right hand? It was around here, sir. The right hand side of his head, or yes, sir. Somewhere by the ear, yes, sir. And he was, he kind of started veering off the road to the uh, left, sir. Okay, and that's when you got out and ran around, yes, sir. And you opened the door, yes, sir. And you tried to pull him out, yes, sir. And so when you shot, and he was still going, gur- yes, sir. So was he setting up when you shot him in the head? It, Again, no, sir. He was lying down on the ground. So you pulled him out of the truck. And just threw him on the ground, and then I heard him gurgling, so I shot him a second time. And then where did you hit him the second time? Uh, I'm not certain, but I believe the head as well. Okay, the front, back, side? Uh, I believe it was the same side as before. Same side as before? Yes, sir. So you, you think you hit him twice, or you know, you know you've hit him, in fact, once in the head? Yes, sir. And then the second round is probably in the head area, too? Yes, sir. Okay. Why did he choose this small, rarely used road to carry out his plan? Because he didn't want anybody to see him commit murder. Why? Because he knew it was wrong. Jared matter-of-factly describes how he shot Gennaro once in the head while driving, and then once again while he was laying on the ground. Then he tries to destroy Gennaro's cell phone. And what did you do then? I uh, grabbed his phone from inside the vehicle. I was going to put it on the ground and uh, shoot it as well. But uh, I have a bit of night blindness and didn't see the steepness of the hill where it started to veer down. Mm-hmm. So when I threw it down, it slid down the hill and landed uh, screen side down. So I wasn't able to find its location. Okay. So his phone is somewhere around his body? Uh, yes, it should be. Okay. It might be underneath his body. Okay. And did you do something with the body after that? Uh, yes, sir. I repositioned it and then I tried to cover it. Uh, Admittedly, not well with the uh, leaves, dirt, and a uh, stick. Okay. A stick? Yes, sir. There was a stick on the side of the hill. I just grabbed everything on the side of the hill and pushed it on top of them. Okay. 
He was going to shoot the phone to destroy it, but I couldn't tell you why. I can't imagine that there was any information on the phone that would point to Jared. It had his fingerprints on it, but all he had to do was to wipe the phone down. He must have thought that there was a chance the phone had some incriminating information on it, so he planned to destroy it so he wouldn't get caught. Why? Because he knew that what he was doing was wrong. Then he covered Gennaro's body so nobody would find it. Why? You guessed it. Because he knew that what he was doing was wrong. At this point, it was Jared's plan to take Gennaro's truck and drive it north, but he wasn't able to get the vehicle out of the ditch. He said that he thought that one of the back wheels was off the ground, making him not get enough traction to back out of the ditch. While he was trying to get the truck free, he said he could still see Gennaro, so he covered him up some more, just in time for a car to pull onto the road. I uh, looked to the left, and uh, from the headlights I saw that I could still see his own shirt, so I covered him up better. And uh, as I was finishing that, I saw the headlights from a car pulling over the uh, hill. So I went out and... Uh, Which way would it come from? It was uh, heading e uh, west from the east side, okay. so from the highway. Huh. And uh, he was slowing down already, so I just came out as quickly as I could from behind the truck and uh, flagged him down by uh, waving my hands. And uh, he asked what was going on. I told him that I had a drowsed. Uh, dozed off and uh, veered off the road and uh, couldn't get my uh, truck unstuck. Then uh, he was... Uh, I think he... Uh, I don't think he knew exactly what happened, but I, don't, I think he knew I did something. Maybe stealing, I don't know. Uh, because like you said, the, no one travels down that road. Um, did you know him? No, sorry, I did not know him. Okay. But since no one travels down that road and he most likely lived in that area, he knew that I didn't. Okay. So, most likely, he uh, was suspicious just from that fact alone, because okay. I had no business being on that road. But uh, he agreed to give me a ride to uh, Asher, nonetheless. Uh, more specifically, he didn't agree to that until his phone didn't work. Uh, we pulled up to about, about the highway, then he uh, dialed a number for me. Uh, I gave him a fake number, that way it wouldn't answer, and if it did answer, then I could just make something up. Uh, whenever it didn't answer, uh, it was a phone that was out of service, uh, he agreed to take me into Asher so I could uh, get my cellular phone, I don't have a cellular phone, to uh, call someone that I knew that could get me out. Okay. And what did he take you to in Asher? Uh, my grandparents' house. Jared is definitely on the autism spectrum. Psychiatrists at his trial diagnosed him with Asperger's, which makes sense. He is intelligent and has an incredible attention to detail, but lacks social skills and doesn't have much emotional response. His entire interview is very matter-of-fact and very detailed. He told the undersheriff that he didn't have a cell phone, so the man in the car offered him his cell phone so he could call someone. So he made a call to a random number, and when there was no answer, the man agreed to drive him to his grandmother's house. I don't think it's clear the way Jared describes it in the interrogation. It's scary to think that this person offered a ride to a man who had just murdered someone else for the hell of it. No reason, just a desire to see what it was like to kill someone. And now he was in the car with another innocent person. Fortunately for this good Samaritan, Jared was no longer interested in killing and was now focused on getting away. You know, getting away with the crime that he knew was wrong. Jared had also left the gun in the truck. He told the undersheriff that the gun was sitting on the center console when the car pulled up, and he went straight over to the car to try to explain away what had happened. The Good Samaritan dropped Jared off at his grandmother's house, where he called his dorm roommate, Shane Schroth. He and Shane had graduated from Asher High School together and were good friends. Jared told Shane he was stuck in a ditch, and Shane offered to call his mom and have her ask his stepdad if he could help Jared out. According to Jared, Shane's parents didn't answer, so he walked the eight or nine blocks down the street to their house where he found a can of WD-40 sitting on the front porch. He took it and headed back to the truck. Now why did you get the WD-40? Uh, WD-40 is a solvent. It would uh, help degrade the uh, oils from my fingers and uh, get rid of my uh, fingerprints, sir. Okay, so you're going to take this kind of WD-40 and go back to the crime scene and use WD-40 on a pickup? Yes, sir. To try to get rid of your fingerprint? Yes, sir. Okay. And did you do that? 
Uh, no, sir. When I was on my way back, as opposed to going down the road directly to it, I cut through a uh, forest area uh, there by an abandoned uh, trail house. And uh, as I was entering the uh, general area of uh, the crime scene, I heard, uh, I believe it was an elderly gentleman cough. I'm not sure who, I'm not sure what. I just left because, well, Around that area, the man who gave me a ride into town was an elderly gentleman. I concluded he might have went back, and uh, the headlights and the brake lights were still on. I thought he might have uh, went to turn them off uh, so my battery wouldn't die. And then he saw the uh, at least the blood, probably the body, though the body wasn't well hidden at all. Okay. So That's the conclusion I reached anyways. You, you was in the woods? Yes, sir. And so you don't really know who it was? Uh, I just heard an elderly gentleman cough. Did you see the pickup? No, sir. Okay. So you couldn't you couldn't see the pickup? No, sir. And so you'd been on were you on the south side of the road in the woods? Yes, sir. And so but you never could see the pickup again or know who was there? No, sir. Okay. So what did you do then? I uh, headed back uh, east instead of south, took a different route to get out of the wooded area, uh, ran the barbed wire fence, jumped the barbed wire fence. Uh, I headed south along another barbed wire fence I found next to the highway. Well, you couldn't see the highway, but you could easily hear it, and I could see the substation from there pretty clearly. Uh, headed south along that, came across another barbed wire fence, jumped it, and uh, then headed to where I started out at, at that abandoned trailer house there, then uh, walked away. So he planned to go back to the crime scene and spray everything down with WD-40 because it would dissolve the oils from his skin and destroy his fingerprints. And why did he want to destroy his fingerprints? Everybody say it with me, because he knew that what he had done was wrong. He claimed to have walked from an area near an abandoned trailer house through the woods towards the truck, but heard someone cough near where the truck was and decided to flee. Except there was one part of this story that wasn't true. The undersheriff stepped out for a few minutes, and he must have gotten some information from another investigator. I know for a fact you didn't get the WD-40 from the front yard. You're right. I planned on keeping him out of this, but I did go into his house. He did give it to me, and yeah. And when you say who, and when you say him, who you... Uh, the parent of the friend that I called. Shane's... Shane's father. Mm -hmm. The stepfather, yes. And you know his name? Uh, Michael Norris. Okay. And what did you tell Michael? I uh, told him about what had happened and asked for his opinion on the next course of uh, action. Okay, you mean you told him what happened, what do you mean? The murder. I told him about So you told, you told Shane's father about the murder you just did? Not the specifics, but the general picture, yes. Okay, can you, you mean what you told him? Not exactly, but I mean, I didn't tell him I fired three shots, missed one shot him in the head, pulled, not all that. I just said that I got a truck, I killed the guy for it. It's in a ditch. Okay. Did you tell him how you did it? Uh, I don't remember, but I might have. Okay. So he took you back to the scene? Uh, no. You said no. You walked? No. Uh, he drove me to the abandoned house that I spoke of, yes. Okay, so Mr. Norris gave you the account of WD-40. Yes, sir. And I believe he probably got that from his bathroom of his house. Uh, I'm not aware of where he got it, but if that's where he says, then yeah. Okay. And... So he drove you from Asher back to the area the, of the scene. Just south of where you would turn on substation road. Yes, sir. And that's where the abandoned trailer house is on the west side. Yes, sir. Jared had told Shane's dad that he had murdered someone and asked him for his advice on what he should do next. Shane's dad, Michael, gave him the can of WD-40 to help him remove the fingerprints. Then he gave Jared a ride to the area near the abandoned trailer house where he started walking through the woods towards the truck. I couldn't find any information that Shane's dad had been punished for aiding Jared. In the interrogation video, you can see a can of WD-40 sitting on the table. That was in Jared's pocket when he was arrested. That along with a purple Crown Royal bag that had some 40 caliber rounds in it. Jared told the undersheriff that, in his original plan, he had given himself six to eight hours to get out of the area, because he didn't want to get caught, you know, for the murder that he knew was wrong. He believed that he was going to shoot Gennaro, dump his body in a ditch, and then drive his truck north. It's believed that someone saw the truck, started investigating, and found the body, leading them to call the police. 
Jared was under the impression that the man who had given him a ride stopped at the truck on his way back home, possibly to turn the headlights of the truck off, and discovered the body, but that may not be the case. It turned out that the gun was missing from the truck. The gun's not in the truck. It was in the truck, sir. And so I need to know where that gun's at. When I left the scene, it was in the truck, sir. It was still in the truck. It was still in the truck, sir. Where was it at in the truck? It was, uh, I believe it was on the center console, but it's possible it could have been between the driver's seat and the center console. Okay, because the center console is pushed up. It's not down. Uh, I don't remember that. Okay. Well, you kept saying it was on the center console. To be on the center console, the center console would have to be in the down position, correct? Yes, sir. The center console is up. So was it up or down when you was there? I think it was down, sir. Okay. So, but your intentions, can I ask you why you had with the gun there if you just killed somebody and you were trying uh, to get to Canada? Because that uh, man pulled up too quickly, sir. Okay. The man had pulled up and he wasn't able to get the gun out of the truck without raising suspicions. He said that that was the main reason he was trying to get back to the truck. He wanted to retrieve the gun and also try to remove his fingerprints. That wasn't the only thing different about the truck from when Jared had left it. There is a note wrote on a piece of paper, on a, like a business card on a passenger side window, stuck on the pickup. The window's up and there's a note stuck in there. It says, come to the house at the end of the road. Did you write that? No, sir. Huh? No, sir. You didn't write that? No, sir. You have any idea how that note could have got there? No, sir. I don't think anything like that was there whenever I left. Okay. So is it possibility that the gentleman? Uh, yes. When I was on the way back into Asher, he had told me that some thieves stole about $1,000 worth of guns of his and that he was looking for him, and if he found him, he would kill him dead on the side of the road. Then I said $1,000 was a fair amount of money, and he said it didn't matter if it was 50 he doesn't like thieves. Okay. Um, so is it possible that he could have, on his way home, he could have stopped and wrote that note? Yes, that's a possibility. I won't deny that. Like I said, I thought it might have been uh, him that called the police. Uh, I still don't know if it was or not, but I thought it might have been him. He went to turn my lights off and then saw the blood and then called, but... uh. If he did write that note, then I don't think he would have called the police. Jared told the undersheriff that the Good Samaritan had had some guns stolen, so maybe he stopped by to turn off the headlights, saw the gun on the center console, and grabbed it so it wouldn't get stolen. Then he left a note so Jared could come down and pick it up when he had gotten his truck free from the ditch. Then someone else saw the truck and called police to report it. It's possible, but there's frustratingly no information anywhere about the gun after this point. No reports of whether or not they found it or where it was. It's Oklahoma. People have guns, and it's not unreasonable for someone in that area to see a gun laying out in someone's vehicle and not think it's suspicious. The undersheriff did ask if it was his gun, though. And was that your gun? Uh, no, sir. And where did you get that gun from? I stole it two weeks ago from a man named Daniel Davis, uh, 217 North Division Street. Now, where's Division Street? Uh, it's the, uh, if you're going down 018 and entering what, Asher. What town is it in? Asher, Obama. And his name's Daniel Davis? Yes. And how did you steal it from his house? Uh, I went into his house. Uh, he, his family and my family are on good terms. I just walked in the door and uh, went back to his mother's room and told her that I had a video game to return to uh, Daniel. Then I went into Daniel's room, put a video game that I brought with me as a way to get into the door, and got the gun. Okay. And so was it in a box or was it... Uh, yes, sir. It was in a uh, case. Okay. And where's the case at? It's still at his house, sir. Okay. So you took the gun out of the case? I took the gun in two clips, sir. He had stolen a gun two weeks earlier. He needed a gun to commit a murder, and so he stole one. He pre-planned this murder and stole a gun that wouldn't be traced back to him. This is the type of activity that gets someone a first-degree murder charge and a life sentence without the possibility of parole. 
Pottawatomie County District Attorney Richard Smotherman said early on that he was considering seeking the death penalty, but obviously that plan changed. After abandoning his plan to return to the truck, he started walking north on Highway 177. He attempted to hitchhike, but nobody would pick him up. After the truck was reported, Under Sheriff J.T. Palmer drove up the highway to look for anyone suspicious on foot and found Jared with his thumb out. He was ordered to the ground and searched for weapons. Before the undersheriff could even read Jared his rights, he blurted out, quote, I'm the one you're looking for, end quote. When he was interrogated, he pretty openly admitted to everything. He had lied about the WD-40 because he said he wanted to leave Shane's dad out of it, but when the undersheriff told him that they knew the truth, he folded pretty quickly. The one thing that nobody could understand was why he did it. I guess I'm having a hard time understanding what you got out of it. Can you, can you, can you help me? I don't really get anything out of it. I mean, but why not? If you wouldn't want to get some self-gratitude or something, why did you do it? I guess is what I'm asking. If I'm pressed to answer, I'll say it's to prove the strength of my resolve. But that's only if I'm pressed to answer. I'm not pressing you. I'm just trying to understand. Then I don't know why. Okay. So it just... Popped in my head. And popped in your head. And you yes, did. sir. Okay. But it's never popped in your head before. Uh, not other people, that, sir, no. That you've, that you, you've never killed before? No, sir. Okay. Animals? No, sir. I've never hunted. I know how to hunt. I know how to make a bone arrow. I know how to uh, field dress animals and whatnot, but I've never hunted before. No. Okay. To prove the strength of your resolve? What kind of answer is that? He seems to be one of those guys who has to prove to people what he's capable of. He had to prove to Wyatt that he wouldn't tap out, and now he needed to prove to himself that he could kill someone? What purpose does that serve in life? I want to ask you this, and you can answer if you want. I just, I'm having a hard time. Yes, sir. Do you feel any remorse? I'm sad that I got caught so quickly. But that's almost lessened by being caught by someone who has a sheriff on their jacket, so... But for killing them, no. Okay, so it, it makes you feel better that, you know, somebody had a sheriff on their jacket that arrested you? Yes, sir. Opposed to what? A deputy or someone like that, sir. Okay, yeah, well, I'm not the sheriff. I'm aware of that. Uh, I'm the undersheriff. The uh, person driving me up here told me that. Okay. But still, it's... So it makes you feel better that you got caught by somebody up in rank than somebody under Yes, sir. But my question again is, do you have any remorse? No, sir. What a horrible douchebag. This was a premeditated murder that should have easily resulted in a conviction. That didn't happen, though. After Jared was arrested, he was interviewed by multiple psychiatrists. During these interviews, he confessed that he had attempted suicide when he was five years old. He said that he had tried to hang himself in a tree, but the knot came undone and his brother later found him unconscious on the ground. He also convinced the psychiatrists that he believed he was king of the world and that he could see ghosts. Even if any of that was true, one thing about Jared was clear. He knew right from wrong at the time of the murders. He had planned out the killing, making sure to find a victim and a place to kill him that would increase his chances of getting away. He attempted to return to the crime scene to remove evidence. He planned to flee to Canada. Somehow, though, both the prosecution's and defense's psychological experts agreed that Jared didn't know right from wrong at the time of his murder. How is that possible? At the end of his interrogation, Jared said this. You know, you've done a terrible thing tonight. Yes, sir. Um, you killed a young man. Yes, sir. Just for the simple fact of... I guess much, pretty much this is say for you. Yes, sir. And what do you think should happen to you? Death sentence, sir. And why do you think you deserve the death sentence? An eye for an eye, sir. Do you believe an eye for an eye? Yes, sir. Apparently, suggesting that you should get the death penalty makes you crazy. 
The fact that he suggested death for himself completely befuddled the psychiatrists and they believed he must not know right from wrong. How could he suggest his own death if he knew what he was doing? So they went off and labeled him too insane to know right from wrong. The bottom line is that these psychiatrists got played by their patient. The judge at the trial apologized and told Gennaro's family that he was required to follow the law. Jared was then sent to the Oklahoma Forensic Center, which is the facility that treats people who have been found not guilty due to mental illness. The apology wasn't good enough for the family or for District Attorney Smotherman, so they worked together to introduce a new bill into the Oklahoma State Senate. Bill 1214 would add the term guilty but with mental defect to the law, making it possible in the state for someone to be found mentally ill while still being able to be found guilty of a crime. Senator Rob Sharp said, quote, The not guilty by reason of insanity defense was created for those who are not mentally capable of understanding their actions, but now we have people who commit violent crimes trying to use this defense even when the crime was premeditated. The law needs to be modified to take into account those who suffer from mental illness but are still mentally capable of understanding their actions. They need to be held accountable. End quote. I'm confused by this because many states have a not guilty by reason of insanity or mental illness defense, but it's well known that the mental illness must be severe enough to cause the defendant to not know right from wrong. If the defendant pre-planned the crime or attempted to cover it up, no psychiatrist would deem them unable to know right from wrong. I'm baffled by how this works in Oklahoma and scared that someone as dangerous as Jared could possibly be released at any time in the future when a doctor deems him safe. The same doctors who deemed him unable to know right from wrong are the same ones who are going to deem him safe, so excuse me for not trusting their diagnosis. District Attorney Smotherman knows that the judgment imposed on Jared Murray was not the right one for this case. Jared knew what he was doing at the time of the murder and continues to pose an extreme risk to himself and others. Jared has tried multiple times to be released from the Oklahoma Forensic Center and be sent to a less secure facility. His most recent request, in 2017, was denied. District Attorney Smotherman said that he will fight any chance that Jared has of ever being released. He said, quote, Jared Murray is a frightening individual. If released, he will kill again. Of this, I have no doubt. End quote. The 2017 ruling made note that Jared makes progress while on medication, but he regresses once he goes off those medications and becomes worse. The judge also noted that Jared makes his own determination of whether or not he needs medication. The likelihood of him continuing his medication if released is very unlikely. On top of that, Jared has stated that he doesn't know when he might hurt someone again. Not if he might hurt someone again, but when. A doctor testified at the hearing that, out of the 200 patients at the Oklahoma Forensic Center, Jared Murray was the most dangerous. If that wasn't enough, officials found a 5-inch knife blade in Jared's possession just days before the hearing. In 2016, Bill 1214 was signed into law in Oklahoma State, effectively making it so people like Jared Murray can't get off of a murder charge just because they suffer from any mental illness. Though I believe that he should have been found guilty anyway. The psychiatrists who claimed that he didn't know right from wrong at the time of the murder should lose their licenses. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing.
Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again, and be safe.